Joyce, you have shared your testimony and so poignantly taught us that God can take one life um, no matter how difficult the circumstances were in the beginning and turn it into a beautiful testimony of His love and His grace. And there's a lot more to tell about your story. So you wanted to sit down and share about how this journey continues. Well, I think it's good to start by saying that one life is not just my life. It's anybody's life who really wants to recover from anything that's happened to you that's painful and really have the very best life that God wants you to have through Christ. He sent His Son to die for us, not just so we could someday go to heaven, but so we could have a really great life while we're here. I knew for a long time I was going to heaven, but I wasn't enjoying the journey. And so really what we're talking about now is about how to really be the person that God wants you to be, how to grow up in Him, how to mature, and how to be a, have a good effect on other people and enjoy the journey. And, and face all of life's little bumps along the way. That's exactly right. What is it that you're seeking in life? The word seek means to crave, pursue, and go after with all of your might. Crave, pursue, and go after with all of your might. Or it even means to require as a vital necessity in your life. What do you believe is really vital to you? What is it that you think that you absolutely have to have to be happy? Sometimes we say to God, well, you know, if this... If I don't get a breakthrough in this, I just don't think I can go on. <laughs> and I wonder what, what would happen if we would just say, you know, God, if I can't have more of you in my life, then I just don't feel like I can go on. I'm hungry for more of you in my life. Not more of what God does for us, but more of God. You know, we all start out understandable, don't know that God expects anything else. We all start out in a mess wanting God to help us get out of that mess that we're in. I need you to do this, God. I need you to do that. I need this breakthrough. I need that breakthrough. Help me get a job. I need a bigger house. I want to get married. Change my husband. Change my kids. You know, whatever. <laughs> you all laughed at that one, so that must be uh, <laughs> something that you're pursuing. And uh, that's good. That, there's nothing wrong with that. God wants to show His love to us. It helps build relationship. It helps us trust Him and make that connection. But there should and must come a transition time in your life where it's no longer, God, what can you do for me? But Lord, what can I do for you? God doesn't want to just heal you so you can sit around somewhere and be healed. He wants to do something in you so He can do something through you. Now, let's look at Romans 5, verses 18 and 19. This talks about the power of one life. And each one of us in this room tonight is one. Just one. You might say, well, I'm only just one. Oh, but my goodness, you are one. <laughs> and it is phenomenal the trouble that one person can cause. And it is phenomenal the blessings that one person can bring. One, just one. Well then, just as one man's trespass, one man's false step and falling away led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness led to acquittal and right standing with God and life for all men. Now we know this is talking about Adam and Christ. Adam's act of sin and disobedience led to condemnation for all men. But Christ's one act of sacrifice, one act of righteousness, led to salvation and righteousness for all men. Can I tell you tonight that you do affect other people? <laughs> and you affect a lot of other people. And then those people that you affect, they affect a lot of other people. So every person's life is very important. And you're either going to add to what's going on on the planet or you're going to take away from it. 
You're either going to help build the kingdom of God or you're going to do harm to the kingdom of God. You're going to be a blessing to people or you're going to end up being a nightmare in other people's lives. Verse 19 says, For just as by one man's disobedience, many were constituted sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. I absolutely love those scriptures. And my life, like many of yours, I'm not the only one with a testimony, but my life, like many of yours, is a testimony of how a person can be so unbelievably messed up, and yet through the power of God, can be completely turned around, and how that one life can end up being a benefit to a lot of people. Seek. Seek me, the Lord said, and you will find me. Seek means to crave, to pursue, and to go after with all of your might. And in case you want to get, you know, kind of religious, I mean, say, seek God. Now, what? Seek. What does seek mean? Have you ever seen a woman seek a 75% off sale? Have you ever seen how people act when you're giving away something free? <laughs> Have you ever seen a man sit in a deer stand in freezing cold weather all night long seeking to shoot Bambi? Hmm? Now, so here's the thing. We know what seeking is, so let's don't act like we don't. Please, 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 please give God some time. <laughs> and not just when you think you're in emergency mode, because maybe you haven't figured out that you're in emergency mode all the time. God told me one time, put in my heart, he said, if you would seek me like you were desperate, then you wouldn't be desperate so often. Amen. Come on, I'm going to say it again. If you will seek God as if you were desperate, then you wouldn't be desperate as often. Matthew 6, but seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all of these things will be given you besides. Seek ye first the kingdom, and all of these things will be added unto you. Number one, people forsake God. Number two, they are indifferent. And number three, where is the fear of God in our society today? And I'm not talking to, you know, if you need this, take it. But if you don't, I'm just talking in general about the entire world and the body of Christ in particular. Where is the fear of God? People don't think anything about getting on television and making jokes about God and making fun of God. And I remember a day when even people who were not believers would not have dared to have done something like that. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all true knowledge and wisdom. We don't have to be afraid of God, but we need to have a reverential fear and respect that God is God, and we are nothing without Him, and if we don't put Him first, we are not going to have a very good ride in life. Amen? All right, number two. One of the things that I had to learn, and it came, it started coming really early in my life, because I don't think you can make progress without this, is to learn how to be honest with yourself about yourself. Hmm. Ouch, ouch. John 8, 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, it's not just hearing the truth that makes us free. It's applying the truth that we hear. And I don't know how much you're aware of this or not aware of this, but 
People are so deceived. There's, it's amazing how many things that people believe that just aren't true at all. But the, the sad thing is, is if you believe it, then it's true for you. One example, maybe you've messed up in life and the devil's got you deceived into thinking that now you're always going to have to have an inferior life. Lie. That's a lie. Because God says that he will take even the fragments of your life and do something amazing with them. God doesn't waste even our pain. God will take even our pain and get use out of it if we give it to him. There's nothing that is unredeemable by God. God can, he is the redeemer and he can redeem anything. That's why no person here tonight or watching by TV, you do not have to have fear in your life that it's too late for you, that you've done too much wrong, that there's no hope for you. You do not have to live in fear because God is the redeemer. He has bought us back with the blood of Christ and everything in our life can be bought back, worked over and turned into something good. Did you hear that? God can take the worst thing that you could possibly imagine and somehow or another he throws a few of his own ingredients in there and it turns out to be a miracle. But all you got to do is give it to him. Just give it to him. Here, God, I've made this huge mess and I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it. I, I'm just giving it to you. And he won't throw it back at you. He'll take it and show himself to be God in your life. We need to be set free from deception. Satan is the great deceiver. We have blind spots in our life. Just like you have blind spots in your side mirrors on your car, your rear view mirrors. That's why you got more than one mirror. You've got this mirror, you've got that mirror, you've got that mirror, because there's blind spots. You gotta look everywhere. <laughs> And we need to go to God and say, God, I want to learn how to be honest with me about me. It's a scary thing, really, when you think about, and this is something we should pray. Every day, I think we should pray, God, help me not to be deceived. Can we begin to pray that on a regular? God, help me not to be deceived. And if there are any areas in my life where I am deceived, then reveal them to me. Reveal truth to me because I don't want to be deceived and I especially don't want to be deceived about myself. Help me not to think more highly of myself than I ought to. Help me not to mistreat people and not even know that I did it. Help me not to be so selfish and full of myself that there's people all around me with needs and I'm just totally oblivious to their needs because I'm so full of me. <laughs> Help me not to blame all of my issues on somebody else. Help me not to sit around my house in deception feeling sorry for myself when the truth is I am so blessed that I don't even hardly know which end is up. Can I tell you the truth? Just go ahead and, and just get ready for this download I'm about to give you. There's no reason for anybody in this room tonight to ever feel sorry for yourself. You know why? Because you got hope. You may have a bad situation, but you've got Jesus and you've got hope and there's answers. And I would say even for people watching by TV, I know some of you have got terrible messes in your life and it's not that I don't have any empathy. I do. But I had to learn this from God. You can be pitiful or you can be powerful, Joyce, but you're not going to be both. So you can take your pick. And everything that was in, uh, wrong in my life was somebody else's fault. It was Dave's fault. If Dave wouldn't do this, then I'd be happy. And if the kids would do that, then I'd be happy. And blame, and it's not my fault, it's not my fault. He said, you're manipulative, you're controlling, you're hard to get along with, you're full of self-pity. Yeah, I didn't feel so good about myself that day. But it helped me get from where I was to where I am. See, here's the thing. Back here in my childhood, I had the test. 
As a young woman in my 20s and 30s, I had the monies. <laughs> but I hadn't gotten them together yet to have a testimony. So I want to know if anybody here is going to make it through the monies and get to the point where you've got a great testimony that's going to encourage other people that the power of God is real in their lives and that there's a great life available for them. It's impossible to grow. It's impossible to get from the test through the monies. <laughs> is this making sense? To the testimony, they kind of go together. You have the test, you get the monies, then you finally get them together, now you got a testimony. But it's impossible to get from the test through the monies to the testimony unless you learn really who you are in Christ and that your who is totally different than your do. I suffered so unbearably with guilt and condemnation. Oh my gosh. Felt like a lifetime of a nightmare. If I didn't feel wrong, I didn't feel right. It started in my childhood because of the abuse and the devil got me convinced there was something wrong with me. And from then on, I had this little record playing in my head, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me? Comparing myself with everybody else. I'd like to say that it stopped when I received Christ and got into the church, but it didn't. I just took it then to a spiritual level. I still compared myself with everybody else, and that was just Christians I was comparing myself with. And then even after I became a preacher, I compared myself with other preachers. It never stops until we learn who we are in Christ, that we are individuals in Christ, and he has an individual plan for our lives, and that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There's only an opportunity for repentance and getting in that elevator and pressing penthouse and going back up to the top floor. Yeah, sometimes we fall to the basement. Sometimes there are rough days. Sometimes there's hard times. There's things that we don't understand, but in the midst of all of it, God loves us. There's no greater teacher than our mistakes. Did you hear me? There's no greater teacher than our mistakes. If we're willing to learn from them, they become extremely valuable. But when you get under condemnation, then everything stops in your life. That's why Jesus said, no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because it's a, it's a treadmill that wears you out and does no good in your life. Has anybody ever been helped by feeling guilty? You say, well, you can't just not feel guilty. <laughs> yes, the Bible says to grieve over your sins, repent over them, then let go of them and go on. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying don't be sorry for your sins, but that's a different thing than getting under condemnation. True godly sorrow leads us to repentance, and ungodly sorrow buries us in guilt and condemnation. You know, there's two kinds of righteousness that you can think about. There's self-righteousness and the God kind of righteousness. Self-righteousness is something that we try to earn from our own good works and perfect behavior. Anybody ever been there, done that? If I do this, then I'll be okay. If I do that, then I'll be okay. If I act like you, I'll be okay. If I do this, I'll be accepted. If I can just do that, I'll be accepted. And God says, I don't want none of that. I will not receive any of your good works as payment for anything that you did wrong. The only thing that appeases God is the blood of Christ. <laughs> Nothing else. And when we understand how amazingly wonderful this free gift of righteousness is, then we begin to respond to God in obedience because we want to out of love for Him, not because we think we have to to get God to love us. Did you hear me? God is saying, here, I give you right standing with me as a gift. I no longer see you as wrong. I see you as right through Jesus Christ. He views us through Jesus Christ. 
My gosh, we should be so excited that we should run the building. I want you to get excited about who you are in Christ. I want you to stop letting the devil walk all over you. I want you to know who you are in Christ. Amen? And you should get up every day, go look in the mirror and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a child of God. Devil, get out of my way. Because I am seeking God today. He is number one in my life. I am ready to face truth, and I know who I am in Christ. Put God first. Be willing to face truth about yourself and know who you are in Christ. And you are well on your way through the monies to the testimony. Come on, get up and give God praise. When Dave and I got married, and that was the second time I'd been married because I married the first young man that came along because I thought nobody would ever want me. I was, felt like I was damaged goods and nobody would ever mm -hmm. want me. And so I married somebody who was also troubled, which is not uncommon for people who have been hurt themselves. And in desperation, I just married the first guy that really showed any real interest in me, and he had lots of problems himself. And so we just had a five-year nightmare. We didn't even really have a marriage. It was just a five-year nightmare. Toward the end of that, I had a child and um, named him David, not knowing that I was going to meet Dave Meyer mm -hmm. later. And my husband, my first husband, ran around with other women and just did a lot of not good things, mm -hmm. including going to prison and, and lots of things. And so when I met Dave, Dave was a godly young man, 26 years old. He had had a really strong relationship with God. And he didn't really try to talk to me about God, but he said, you know, will you go to church with me? And I was more than ready to do that because I had received Christ as a nine-year-old child, but never had any teaching. And just to show the, the beautiful simplicity of how God works in our lives, even while I was still married to my first husband, knowing down deep inside it was not going to work, I can remember laying beside him in bed at night and praying, God, please someday give me somebody that will really love me. Because I knew he didn't really love me somebody that will really love me, and I would add to it, and somebody that will take me to church. Hmm. And then Dave said to me, will you go to church with me? So, okay, it was interesting that it, it was just like God saying, here it is. Right. And so, really, when Dave asked me to marry him, I didn't know what love was. I, ca I can't, I mean, I thought Dave was nice looking, you know, I saw hope there, but I didn't have any idea what l real love was because I'd been hurt so much. Mm -hmm. So you were at a time where you were, really forming what what a marriage, what love, as you said, really is, and, and still walking through your own healing process. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know how to uh, work with other people. I didn't know how to be in relationships mm -hmm. because everything I had seen as an example, my father controlled everybody with fear and my mother cowered under that. Well, that wasn't my nature at all. And so, you know, I just came out of everything like, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, Dave was a pretty peaceful man, and uh, I just tried to rule the roost, as they say, yeah. and I was very <laughs> manipulative and controlling, and he was only going to put up with that so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my way to handle everything was, well, just, I'm out of here. And so I threatened that a couple of times and saw that wasn't going to work. And thank God, by his grace, I stayed and worked through things. So often we just run away from things and then you just, you're always all your life running away from something, mm -hmm. running away from another thing. And I really encourage people to, to stick in the situations, you know, and, and let God work you through the things that you need to work through. Because a lot of people, Ginger, that have been hurt, they don't know anything about relationships. You just, you, you just, it's very difficult. There was no to, place to learn it. Yeah, it's very difficult to connect with a human being. I always teasingly say, God said a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one. And I said, he didn't tell us what the becoming meant. You know, right. that, that's yeah. the lifetime of journey that we're talking about. Well, and you also had the opportunity together to learn a lot of those lessons along the way. We did. We learned a lot of things along the way. And now we're going to be married. Well, we're married 47 years soon. And so we've obviously made it. And uh, Dave has just been great. I don't really know how he put up with me sometimes, but he... He was prepared by God to do that. And there's even a lot of people watching this that they've got a strong relationship with God and maybe they're in a relationship with somebody that is troubled 
like I was or has some very unique and kind of off-base uh, traits in their personality. But we just have to remember sometimes that, that everybody who is acting bad is not acting bad because they want to. They're acting out of hurts that they have. And I always say hurting people hurt people. Just like my dad hurt me because he'd been hurt. And I was basically hurting Dave because I'd been hurt. But he knew that. See, he was smart enough to understand that. And he was able to trust God to heal me and to be long-suffering and patient while God did that. And it always kind of takes somebody that's willing to sacrifice to see somebody else made whole. Well, the three things that we talked about today was to number one, put God first. Number two, be honest with yourself about yourself. And number three, know who you are in Christ. These are three major steps towards overcoming your past pain and learning how to enjoy your life. Extreme poverty is a huge problem in this area just outside of Hyderabad, India. But there are two young girls that we want to tell you about. Their names are Bhavana and Nandini, and they are facing something that is so difficult. The fact is, they are girls, and that's basically all it takes. My name is Nandini. I'm studying in fourth class. I have nine years old. My name is Priya Bhavana. I'm studying in ninth class. Uh, I, I am uh, 14 years old. 14 years old. What kind of problems are, are your family facing? My father is not there in my home. He is swimming outside. I am a bear. 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 I am a God is taking care of you. Yes, uh, God is taking care about me in all my uh, necessities and He is giving me very good health. Then what do you like to do together? Uh, we will pray together every day and we'll pray, play every day. Whenever we have time, we'll make funny jokes, we'll sit, uh, study, and we'll learn about God. What does it mean to you when you come here to visit and you see your daughters are happy? As I'm sure you know, there are many parts of the world where simply being born a girl and not a boy makes life very difficult. India is one of those places. Together we can make a difference, and we are. The girls that you see behind me are part of our Hand of Hope sponsored children's home. And we're able to not only keep them in a safe place, an environment that is loving, but to let them know that what society says about them is not true, that it's what God says about them that matters. They are valuable and they are loved. You are helping make this possible. Don't ever look at a situation and think it's too big to make a change. Together, we are making a change, and we thank you for being part of it. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl/partner.